Lulu's interrogation obviously prompts a bit of self-consciousness in Stanley and he goes to the mirror and, and looks in it and that, I think that's the contrast between the two there is that he's, he's very adamant about his need to wear glasses and, and therefore is adamant about his, his moral and social vision but he is, is particularly lacking in, in an honest self-awareness of his flaws. He goes into the kitchen, takes off his glasses and begins to wash his face. And this is where the entrance and exits in the play are particularly important. Because just at this crucial moment is the moment in which Goldberg and McCann arrive. And it's this moment where he sacrifices the symbol of his vision, that, the, that this menacing threat to him arrives. And so there, the removal of his glasses and the, entry, the entrance of Goldberg and McCann, the juxtaposition of those two events I think functions as a, a revelation of the threat that these characters pose to Stanley um, and also to his his ability to see things clearly um, and and to take a stance against convention so he walks downstairs Stanley wiping his face glimpses their backs through the hatch and and here he, he slips on his glasses and sidles through the kitchen door and out of the back door so again there is this the sense that he reacts with a guilty conscience to the, to their arrival and i think the stage business here is particularly important because it gives him a sense of foreknowledge of of the reasons for their arrival so we 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 again see that he's guilty in some respects or fearful at least but we're distanced and alienated from the cause and effect the rationale behind it and so we, we this plays into you know pinter's sort of unknowable interpersonal epistemology the, the 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 difficulty you know the unknowable way in which we are we we, we cannot access and know ourselves with knowledge so they arrive and their dialogue is again telling is this this is it are you sure sure i'm sure their their dialogue importantly is is as evasive and as hollow as, as Stanley's is with Lulu and as, as um, Meg's is with Petey. But they're assertive, and this is simply the, the, the way that Printer presents power, is that power is just the, the, the same ev evasive um, alienation and distance and, and, and flawed communication as the subordinate positions in society, but it's simply done with more aggression and, and, and assertiveness. And so, you know... The, the certainty that Goldberg communicates here is enough to convince McCann temporarily. But again, what we see early on as well is, is McCann's casting as this kind of anxious interrogator. But the, importantly, the pause after Goldberg's sure, I'm sure, and, and the repetition in this phrase is important because it, it, I think it almost highlights the, the empty reassurance that the line contains. His pause is, a, is an important moment of that inarticulacy where he, he's not certain about their reasons for arrival he has no real conception of um the central purpose and rationale behind their interrogation but it's purely the necessity to act with confidence McCann moves on and says what now don't worry yourself McCann take a seat what about you what about me are you going to take a seat and this 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 dialogue that sort of toos and fro's around the issue of sitting down anticipates the, the, the physical drama during the inter interrogation when, when Stanley refu initially refuses to sit down and both of them insist on him adopting that physically subordinate position on the stage. And, and it's that crucial moment in the play where his um, conscious subord self-subordination becomes actually seals his destiny. And Goldberg tries to reassure him by, you know, saying that we'll both do it. You know, we'll both sit down. And then Goldberg is in, in the, the linguistic mode that we, we come to see is familiar with him. Sit back, McCann. Relax. What's the matter with you? I bring you down for a few days to the seaside. Take a holiday. Do yourself a favor. Learn to relax, McCann, or you'll never get anywhere. This is an extremely euphemistic description of their purpose for being there. I bring you down for a few days to the seaside. It makes it sound so innocent. And that's part of Pinter's warning all the time is about the euphemistic, evasive language that is, are used by those in power to justify their um, objectives. And a, a holiday, of course, is, is this is not a holiday. And it mirrors the language that's used for the, the, the title of the play, the birthday party. Of course, this you know birthday party is 
a, a ritual celebration and an assertion of self and, and, and the purpose of the, of the interrogation is to grimly invert or th- that the signification of that ritual and to rob Stanley of his sense of self and identity. Learn to relax, McCann, or you'll never get anywhere. This is the first of his very cliche phrases that show his emptiness and, and are part of um, the linguistic patterning that he uses to represent Goldberg throughout the play, to, to rob him of authenticity, to show him up for the, the, the vacuous, empty individual that he is. You know, Goldberg's language is, is a kind of collage of various types of conventional discourse that through their familiarity actually alienate us from any kind of authentic subjective content on his part we don't know him we never do because his language is such a mixed um register of of various types of conventional um inauthenticity and this is what follows here he sits at the table right the secret is breathing Take my tip. It's a well-known fact. Breathe in, breathe out. Take a chance. Let yourself go. What can you lose? You know, in in this this opening, there's obviously it's 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 adult, filled with cliche, but none of the thoughts are um, complete. You know, he doesn't internalize any of the thoughts. They're only really extrapolated discourse from elsewhere. You know, they're little. You know, it, when he says it's a well-known fact in a complete sentence, we're not sure about what he's even referring to. The secret is breathing. Well, what's the well-known fact that the secret is breathing? Well, of course, the language of facts implies objective truths, and and this is the equivalent of, of sort of folk tales. That you know, there's no logic in this at all. He says, look at me, when I was an apprentice yet McCann, every second Friday of the month, Uncle Barney used to take me to the seaside, regular as clockwork, Brighton, Camby Island, Brottingdean. These are all places on the south coast of England. Uncle Barney wasn't particular. After lunch on Shabbos, we'd go and sit in a couple of deck chairs, you know, the ones with canopies. We'd have a little paddle, we'd watch the tide coming in, going out, the sun coming down. Golden days, believe me, McCann. Now, importantly... He, he's deliberately typecast as this sort of um, Cockney Jew. You know, Pinter deliberately cast him as a Cockney Jew and he deliberately cast McCann as a kind of o- overtly patriotic Irishman. Partly because they are two of the most conventionally repressed ethnic identities, um, sorry, oppressed ethnic identities, in, particularly in British history and, and the history of the United Kingdom. And that's very deliberate it's a very deliberate disturbance of the way in which you know we classify who are the oppressors and who are the oppressed you know we have these two oppressed ethnic identities becoming the oppressors but also here that the language that he uses is a mixture of various forms of either language that signifies his his ethnic difference you know the, the, the phrase shabbos is the um the yiddish hebrew phrase for for the sabbath but also stories these reminiscences are you know archetypally sort of english um conventional stories of social belonging you know taking your taking your nephew down to the seaside on a trip and sitting on the deck chairs and having a little paddle and watching the tide coming and going out the sun going down golden days believe me McCann. and then he looks reminiscent and in that uh sort of mixture of of, of difference and integration there's again a sense of of sort of artful performance, almost as if this this nostalgic reminiscence is a, is a performance of an empty self, rather than you know the authentic emotional outpourings of, of of a real individual. And then he segues on to his uncle Barney. Uncle Barney, of course, he was an impeccable dresser, one of the old school. He had a house just outside Basingstoke at the time, respected by the whole community. Now this is very clearly an ironic contrast to Stanley, that he's an impeccable dresser and respected by the whole community. community. Stanley himself is the, the individual that shuns community and shuns convention and cares nothing for their respect. And, and, and that's signified partly through his, his neglect of his physical experience. And Uncle Barney in, in Goldberg's you know loosely truthful reminiscence um, I think stands as an ironic contrast to him. But importantly, he's lost in these reminiscences, and I think that invites comparison 
to Blanche, and this is something that's absolutely not unique to Goldberg in this play. You know, whereas Blanche is the character of of of, of illusion and self deception. In this play, every character is prone to this lack of connection to reality because they can't handle its 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 sort of emptiness and its void. So he carries on in this vein, Goldberg, really for the rest of the play. You know, he's extremely extremely um, evasive and vacuous a lot of the time. He refutes authenticity. He says, culture? Don't talk to me about culture. He was an all-round man. What do you mean? He was a cosmopolitan. So we think here of this, you know, he's talking, he's sort of anticipating imagined questions about identity, about his ethnic identity, about his Uncle Barney's Jewishness. You know, in this paranoid story about racial integration, I think. And here he dismisses that idea. And the all-round man, I think, is supposed to refute the concept of authenticity and individual integrity. And I think it, it anticipates a sort of non-existent opposition to Jewish assimilation into British culture here. And I think it shows up that, that discourse for what it, for, as, as another form of empty language that screens authentic feeling. So... McCann says, hey, Nat, you know, he, he realises he's, he's lost to the world and there's a distance between them here because Goldberg is reflective that we see in the stage direction. Yes, one of the old school. They're completely at odds with each other in, what they're, in, the, in terms of their consciousness and that distance is, again, you know, shown between these two uh, sort of violent establishment figures. And then the uncertainty about the task itself gives us that sense of abstract purpose without knowledge and unsettles or undermines their, their sense of menace here. So Goldberg's settling into an armchair later on after this, but the dialogue beforehand, how do we know this is the right house? What? How do we know this is the right house? What makes you think it's the wrong house? I didn't see a number on the gate. I wasn't looking for a number. No. You know, none of these answers are affirmative responses. And what we again see is the slipperiness of those in power. You know, this language very clearly exposes the way in which people are able to ignore questions and provide you know, to, to evade providing concrete direct responses. And he, he then settles into an armchair. You know, one thing Uncle Barney taught me, he's back on his, in his reminiscences. But again, his settling in the armchair is, is supposed to be a kind of, um, I think, an ironic mirror of standing. You know, he's, he's, he's making himself comfortable immediately. Uncle Barney taught me that the word of a gentleman is enough. That's why when I had to go away on business, I never carried any money. One of my sons used to come with me. And obviously this is vaguely related to, to the, the dialogue above about McCann just trusting his word. Um, but here, I think it's supposed to play with our idea of, of, of their potential menace. You know, we're supposed to immediately sort of see this language as the language of familiarity. And then when Pinter, Pinter later on goes on to expose the... The, the the aggressive core of this character, then we see we, we discover that this language really is this kind of empty rhetoric, and 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 that's not really trusted. So a little further down, Goldberg expresses his frustration with McCann's sort of morbidity. He says, McCann, what are you so nervous about? Pull yourself together. Everywhere you go these days, it's like a funeral. There's this sort of ominous suggestion of what is about to happen, I think, in those lines. McCann says that's true. True, of course it's true. It's more than true. It's a fact. And again, this language, again, is so needlessly repetitive and undermines its own pretenses through its repetitions. Of course it's true. It's more than true. You can't really have, if you're talking about truth, and true or false, you can't have something that's more than true. And, and a fact itself is, 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 type, is a type of truth. So the fact that he distinguishes a fact from truth itself shows us that the meaning of truth is actually a lot less certain than, than we would normally consider it in his, in his mind. The truth itself is something subjective and, and malleable. McCann says, sure, I trust you, Nat. But why is that? Before you do a job, you're all over the place. And when you're doing the job, you're as cool as a whistle. So there's this, within this description of McCann, I think there's this, important sort of exposure of the way in which power works, that it's pragmatic without 
purpose and without a sense of ethics. You know, the, the moments before the task, before this interrogation takes place, are the, is the space in which McCann and Goldberg have space to worry about their own rationale, their own identities, their own role in life. And this is why McCann is so disturbed. And that when once the action of dominating someone else has taken place, that's when he sort of comes alive as an individual. And what that shows us is that he, he can only make sense of himself in relation, you know, relatively to someone else. And the identity itself is is merely a, a relative construction, something that is made through your interactions with others and, and the extent to which you either dominate or are dominated by them. You know, there's nothing else to selfhood other than your hierarchical relationship with others. And then here, importantly, he doesn't know why. He's not conscious of this personal weakness. He says... I don't know now. I'm just all right once I know what I'm doing. Uh, when I know what I'm doing, I'm all right. So there's this circularity to his explanation that, again, shows us the emptiness, their lack of ethics, their lack of a moral code, their lack of purpose. And McCann then shifts into this sort of evasive praise of him. Uh, Goldberg, sorry. Well, you do it very well. Thank you, Nat. You know what I said when this job came up? I mean, naturally, they approached me to take care of it. And you know what I asked for? Who? You. That was very good of you, Nat. No, it was nothing. You're a very capable man, McCann. Of course, what we again see here is that we're detached from the motives that Goldberg has for praising him. We don't know what he's done that's capable, but we do know that he has some capability and that it's purely being expressed in relation to Goldberg. So again, McCann's, McCann's capability is purely constructed by Goldberg's sort of affirmation of it through language, which is in itself evasive and lacking in, in direct purpose. So we can then we can't really trust the assertion itself. And therefore we can't we can't take McCann to be anything more than just a kind of abstract power itself. You know, his character is, is simply the ability to dominate someone else and there's nothing else to it other than that. And McCann said, that's a great compliment that coming from a man in your position. Well I've got a position, I won't deny it. So here uh, they're not they're not really. You know, there's no material basis for their power, other than their, their sort of non-denial of, of of sort of mutual agreement here. They, they 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 evade saying what the material circumstances of their power are. So he said, "That's a great compliment, Nat, coming from a man in your position." Well, I've got a position. I won't deny it. You know, it, it, there's no reflection there on on actually his merits or value as an individual, but purely his relational his relational position in society, that his, his value is purely because he has some kind of role and it's nothing to do with who he is. And then Gold, McCann is just simply an assertion. Of this. There's, a, there's, there's an irony in the language though, that you certainly have and yet we certainly don't know what it is. And then Goldberg says, I would never deny that I had a, had a position. So again, it's evasive. We, it's not that I have a position, it's X, Y, Z. It's I wouldn't deny that I had one. And what a position. It's not a thing I would deny. So again, there's this, it's not even um, an affirmation. It's, it's just a refutation of the possibility of denial. You know, it, it's, it's a double negative and affirmative term. So we don't, we have absolutely no idea and are deliberately kept um, distant and alienated from the material source of these characters' power. You know, we've got absolutely no sense of, of, of who they are and what their source of, of authority is. And that's important in Pinter's aesthetic because it shows us the sort of the abstract quality of power and, and the fact that it isn't attached to all of the conventional sources that we tend to associate it with. And there's this very deliberate theological element to this. Goldberg says, say no more. And McCann says, you've always been a true Christian. And then Goldberg ironically says, well, in a way, well, of course, what we've seen is that Goldberg is Jewish. And so this idea of him being a true Christian is deliberately illogical and you know th there could be a sense of him admiring his kind of religiousness and his piety and his respect for hierarchy but the, the thought of being a true christian here the fact that we've already seen that he's jewish undermines again the concept of truth itself that, that what we mean by true christian is entirely subjective and it's mccann's definition who is a christian and then mccann says no i just thought i'd tell you that i appreciate it and then goldberg says it's unnecessary to recapitulate which is extremely ironic with what he's said so far because he's, he's, he's carried that act out himself. He's recapitulated, he's reiter reiterated many of his own lines. And then McCann says, you're right there, which is 
a recapitulation. And then Goldberg says, quite necessary. So he, in the act of, of saying that it's unnecessary to repeat himself, repeats himself. And so this deliberate verbal irony um, creates this sense of false modesty. But also, I think, mirrors Blanche. You know, there's a sense of false modesty about Blanche's, um, or the reverse, sorry, the kind of, a false sense of supremacy in Blanche's um, identity and personality. And then there's a pause that, again, shows us this, this sense of inarticulate loss of thought. And that's what, that's what we've got here. I think we've, we've sort of degenerated through this dialogue into just th things that shouldn't be done. You know, I wouldn't deny that I had a position. It's unnecessary to recapitulate. And the pause is this sense of purposelessness, that all we know is what we shouldn't do. We don't have any clear sense of, of, a, of a moral purpose or a code. And then McCann leans forward, he's in moment of confession. Hey, now, just one thing, what now? This job, now listen, this job, is it going to be like anything else we've ever done? So, he, he's de desirous of concrete facts about the job itself, but again, the only way he can make sense of that is, is through relativism, through something else that he's already done before, and that he, he needs some sort of tangible comparison. And therefore... What we see then is, is, is Goldberg's evasive language because he, he completely evades giving him any answers and just touts him. Tuts. And then he said, McCann just says, no, just tell me that, just that, and I won't ask any more. And all he wants to hear is exposing the meaninglessness of language. It's exposing the meaninglessness of his reassurances because, you know, he's, he's asking him for a meaningless reassurance and, and it's purely the act of hearing it that will make him feel better. Goldberg then sighs, stands, goes behind the table, ponders, looks at McCann, and then speaks in a quiet, fluent, official tone. So this is where we have this warning about the language of power, that McCann asks for answers, and this is what, you know, this euphemistic, distant language of officialdom that Goldberg goes on to in the following lines, I think shows us the distance between them and shows us the way in which this linguistic register is so expert at evading concrete information. Goldberg says the main issue is a singular issue, which is itself a kind of logical tautology. That you don't, you, if something's the main issue, it's also then probably a unique or singular or important one, and quite distinct from your previous work. So it's different, but it's not. It's not again. It's not what it is. It's simply that it's not like something else that you know. So again, we we don't have a positive affirmation of the nature of this work, as we don't have a positive affirmation of where their power comes from, as we don't have a positive affirmation of Stanley's source of guilt. We are kept away from all of these things because those are the, the conventional ways in which we understand selfhood, relationships, um, hierarchy, society. All of those things are kept from us deliberately. Certain elements, however, might well approximate importance of procedure to some of your other activities. So we've got this language that obviously in official speak means that there's certain parts of this that might be quite similar to some things that you've done in the past. But the language itself becomes like a shroud that might well approximate in points of procedure to some of your other activities. That We've got this kind of night... This is the language that Orwell had a nightmare about, you know, these these, um, pass, these nominalizations that create cloudiness. And that's very deliberate so that Goldberg can evade giving McCann any answers. All is dependent on the attitude of our subject. At all events, McCann, I can assure you that the assignment will be carried out and the mission accomplished with no excessive aggravation to you or myself. Satisfied? So the only certainty is that the task itself will be complete. The only certainty is that their power shall be wielded and that someone else will be brought into a position of subordination. That is the only certainty that we can be assured of. And that's what Pinter seems to be saying in this play, is that you know, your identity is a sham, your relationships are a sham, the language that you use is nothing but a shroud for the hollowness of your own selfhood. But what you can be sure about is that if you aren't aware of who you are, other people will seek to dominate you. Other people will seek to get on top of you and assert their power over you. Because that is the only way in which people make sense of themselves. Through relational hierarchies that they, they construct through dominating or being dominated. So McCann says, sure, thank you, Nat. So this works, this sad, evasive official language actually functions, performs its function and reassures McCann. So Meg enters on the left and, and Goldberg speaks to her. I'm oh, Mrs. Bowles. You know, Meg says, yes. And then what we see here is quite charming. You know, Goldberg turns on the surface of politeness and, and, and offers a, a fairly stark contrast with the way that Stanley talks to Meg. 
We spoke to your husband last night. Perhaps he mentioned us. We heard that you kindly let rooms for gentlemen, so I brought my friend along with me. We were after a nice place, you understand. So we came to you. I'm Mr. Goldberg, and this is Mr. McCann. You know, there's a, the pattern of language here is of, of amicable sociability, of kindly gentlemen, friends, nice place. So we came to you. You know, there's, it's, it's flattery, and it's port portraying them as these sort of sociable, charming men, which, of course, is the complete reverse of the... The, the rationale for their appearance and the hostility that they would treat Stanley with. And Meg, obviously being stupid, just said, oh, very pleased to meet you, and they shake hands. Their, their dialogue then descends into this sort of ludicrous farce and reveals the hollowness of, of, of social rituals where they meet each other. We're pleased to meet you too, that's very nice. You're right. How often do you meet someone it's a pleasure to meet? Never. But today it's different. How are you keeping Mrs. Boswell? Very well, thank you. Yes, really? Oh yes, really. I'm glad. And so what we see here, this is probably the most obvious sign of, of the way in which Pinter views language as this sort of evasive communication ritual, that we, we do this so much in our daily lives when we say to each other, oh, how are you? And, you know, no one actually bothers to listen to the answer. We just kind of ask it as a social tick almost, as a way to um, overcome the sense of awkwardness and distance between individuals. Meg obviously uses her favourite phrase, that's very nice, because that's literally all she is po possible, you know, the, the only possibility that she has of discernment is of, of general, just good and bad terms. That's all she can understand, really. And Goldberg says, you're right, how often do you meet someone? It's a pleasure to meet, which again, that, that question exposes the fallaciousness of the, of, of the, the communicative act of we're pleased to meet you. It, it exposes to us that that phrase itself is so conventionally used as a hollow reminder of, uh, sorry, a way of overcoming distance and a way of overcoming awkwardness and that it's meaningless. And McCann confirms this by just saying, never. And Goldberg asks the question, how are you keeping Mrs. Bowles? Oh, very well, thank you. And Goldberg says, yes, really? Oh, yes, really. As if to, you know, that he's, he's stunned that she, she, she could be keeping well. But this greeting, these salutations, I think, is is a is a commentary on the lies and the and the alienation that they shroud, rather than a declaration of their of their social value. Goldberg says, "Well, so what do you say? You can manage to put us up, eh, Mrs. Ball? Was it would well, it would have been easier last week? Again, she kind of goes through this feigned sense of industry, and and provides no reason in the way that you know Goldberg has provided no reason to McCann for their presence, you know, and, and a rationale she provides no reason. It would, eh? Yes. Why? How many have you got here at the moment? And then." Here, this dialogue exposes the illogical nature of the fact that it would have been easier last week. Because she just says, just one at the moment. Just one? Yes, just one. Until you came. And your husband, of course. Yes, but he sleeps with me. What does he do, your husband? He's a deck chair attendant. Oh, very nice. Yes, he's out in all weathers. <coughs> so these friendly questions are kind of part of the inter interrogation. And so we see, <coughs> before we see them treating Stanley with hostility, we see them... In, in a social scenario, using that same sort of linguistic pattern of interrogation. But what that does, I think it make when we later on see them doing something similar in a much more directly and overtly hostile fashion, it makes this type of questioning seem much more sinister. And that's part of Pinter's overall attempt to, to disturb the everyday. And that's where that genre mixing of, of abstract surrealism and naturalistic realism comes into his overall aesthetic is that we want to make this type of very conventional language seem surreal and strange and nightmarish and that's what we're seeing here we're, we're seeing the, the regular version but what we then later on see in the play is that the disturbed version um so a little further meg starts taking all of her shopping out of her bag she takes her purchases out of her bag um and Goldberg says, of course, and your guest, is he a man? A man or a woman? No, a man. So the fact that, you know, it conf she's confused by context, you know, she, she doesn't recognise the strangeness of this particular scenario. He says, your guest, is he a man? And Meg just simply says, a man. And then Goldberg responds, or a woman. And then she responds again, no, a man shows us that she, she's confused by the question itself. She, she has no idea about why he would be asking that question and shows, I think, the, the 
the fact that social interaction to her with anyone that takes any interest in her is completely alien. And so they start asking questions about Stanley, obviously, and the irony here is, is that she, she has absolutely no idea that they are asking this for sinister reasons. So she, when she's answering the questions, drifts into the fantasy that Stanley himself drifts into multiple times about his, his piano talent, and he drifts into the fantasy mode that, that Goldberg has already exhibited in his reminiscences about going to the seaside with his uncle Barney. She says, does he work here? He used to work. Again, not answering the question deliberately. He used to work somewhere, but not here. He used to be a pianist in a concert party on the pier. He used to be a pianist in a single event. So again, you see a lack of understanding here because it's, you know, it's, it's, it's purely based on the single event and the single story. And Goldberg says, oh yes, on the period, does he play a nice piano? Oh, lovely, she sits at the table. He once gave a concert. You know, if he's a pianist, Obviously, he's going to have given a concert more than once. But precisely what this shows us is that she has completely wholesale bought into Stanley's sort of evasive reminiscences and his sort of freestyling with the truth that he does whenever he shifts into this um, sort of ill illusory recollection of himself and his identity.